Hello again, Deacon Dana here. This is uh, reflection number 18. I've called it blessed to be Americans. A and how blessed we are to be Americans. A little over 231 years ago on March 4th, 1789, our constitution, drafted by our founders, ratified by the states, went into effect. In the first 10 amendments to that constitution, what we call our Bill of Rights, the God-given rights of the people are protected from the government. That's right, the Bill of Rights limits the government, not the people. It was designed to be a document in the words of Abraham Lincoln, Lincoln of the people, by the people, and for the people. The Constitution doesn't celebrate the government, it celebrates the American people, you and me. When we look at the Bill of Rights, we discover something else that reveals the priorities of the founders to ensure future generations understood its importance, the very first of the rights guaranteed by the founders is the right of religious freedom. The First Amendment begins with the words, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. According to our Constitution then, we have the right to worship freely without the threat of government interference. Because it is our Constitution, you and I, indeed all Americans, must ensure that the government we elect to do the work of the people, to do our work, must never usurp or trample on these God-given rights protected by the Constitution. Yes, indeed, we are blessed to be Americans. But we, the citizens of this nation, are sovereign, and we must never abdicate our sovereignty by allowing politicians and bureaucrats to rule in our stead. As Americans, we are not ruled, we are represented. Those in government are called to do our work. As Christians though, we must also live under the authority of God, who is the true sovereign, the creator of the cosmos. For us then, his law supersedes all human law. It might seem like an odd choice given the theme of this reflection. But what I'd like you to do now is open your Bible and turn to Matthew's Gospel. Read Matthew chapter 8, verses 28 to 34. Matthew 8, 28 to 34. Now push pause and hold the video while you read that. Okay, I trust you've all read it. This visit by Jesus to the land of the Gadarenes is a remarkable incident, isn't it? A unique event in his public ministry. I mean, Jesus, who spent most of his public life among the Jews, here does something very different. He crosses the Sea of Galilee and enters the province of Gadara, a place populated largely by pagans. Gadara is, a, is depicted as a district especially under the sway of the evil one. God's name is not evoked there, his law is not obeyed, and so we shouldn't be surprised to find demoniacs dwelling there in their natural habitat. It must have been disturbing a disturbing visit for the apostles, as evidenced by the fact we hear absolutely nothing from them during this visit. We sense, however, that Jesus is showing them something, showing them the kinds of challenges they will face when they go out into the world to make disciples of all nations. Until now, they've been accustomed to people coming to Jesus for healing and instruction and forgiveness. Indeed, only moments before they crossed the sea, the apostles themselves had begged Jesus to save them from a freak storm that had arisen. Yes, they'd heard many people pleading with Jesus for help. They'd even uttered, uttered some of those pleas themselves. Lord, if you wish, you can make me clean. Only say the word and my servant will be healed. Lord, that I might see. And the apostles themselves, Lord, save us for we are perishing. How different were the cries they heard this day in that strange place. What have you to do with us, son of God? A remarkable question by these demons, isn't it? How darkly urgent is their need to separate themselves from Jesus? And how do they do it? By denouncing him as the son of God. Imagine that. Yes, in spitting out their hatred, their poison, they who lie so easily 
can do nothing but proclaim the truth. We sense some tiny remnant of goodness in their nature, but one that is exclusively intellectual. They know who Jesus is, but knowledge isn't love. And that's something we who engage in Bible study must always be wary of. We study scripture, not simply to expand our knowledge of God and of his teaching, but rather to deepen our love for him so we can live the kind of life he wants for us. The demons, though, through their own choice, have totally disfigured the beauty of their souls, a beauty created in the beginning by God himself. Now no beauty remains. No moral order remains. Is it any wonder then that this acknowledgement of Jesus' identity should escape from them, just as everything else does with destructive violence? What have you to do with us? Yes, indeed. What can the spirit of evil have in common with the Son of God? In a sense, this question, what have we in common, is the same question the centurion asked of Jesus when he uttered, Lord, I am not worthy. But for the demons, it's not a matter of unworthiness, but rather, rather a, a question filled with, with hollow pride. It's as if they sneer at Jesus. How dare you come to us? Don't you, son of God, have better things to do? You see, the demons can lie to everyone except to God. Have you come here to torment us before the appointed time? You see, these demons can't believe that Jesus has entered this place among the tombs of the dead where evil believed itself safe from God's word. But now they know that Jesus' redeeming work knows no boundaries. The word of God must be spread throughout the earth and no place is, is exempt. How does the Apostles' Creed put it? He descended into hell. They know too that their hold over a portion of humanity is only temporary. For they scream at Jesus, reproaching him for coming before the Kairos, before the appointed season of definitive judgment and the expulsion of the forces of evil. How odd. <laughs> While they clearly know who Jesus is and hate him for it, they appear pathetically misinformed about the extent of their authority. But in Jesus' presence, they resign themselves to being cast out. Unlike the centurion who saw his servant's illness as an evil that needed Jesus' healing intervention, these demons, having made evil the cause of their very being, find only torment in their healer. Rather than surrender to, surrender to Jesus' healing presence, they beg Jesus to send them into a herd of pigs a choice that reveals their true condition. Brothers and sisters, Jesus offers each one of us healing and life. There is just one other choice and it leads only to death. How illuminating, how humiliating, <laughs> how unbelievable this incident must have been for Satan. Satan, the pure spirit, is routed by the mere presence of this divine person who has inexplicably humbled himself by embracing the weakness of our human physical and psychological nature. Yes, Satan still lurks about seeking souls who will admit him, but at the same time, in the presence of Jesus Christ, he is powerless. When Jesus is present in our individual souls, in our community, in our nation, Satan has no power. He can do nothing. When a people and a nation turn away from Jesus Christ, when a people decide that the presence of God, the name of God, is an embarrassment, that the sovereignty of God is an insult to our intelligence and freedom, then they create a vacuum that Satan is only all too eager to fill. Although our nation is far from perfect, for most of its history, it has openly and willingly turned to God for help and guidance in God we trust, is still embossed on our currency. And we still pledge ourselves as one nation under God. But sadly, although religious freedom is a fundamental human right, one that comes not from man, but from God, much of recorded history 
is a story of men trying to deny it, to take it away. Although our nation's history may have given their, although many in our nation's history may have given their lives so you and I can reap the, the benefits of religious freedom and the other rights enumerated in our Constitution. Like those who came before us and sacrificed so much to guarantee the freedoms we so often take for granted, we too are called to defend these rights. But today the greatest threat to these rights is not from foreign adversaries, but from many of those, I suppose, we've elected or appointed to exercise judgment. The church, and brothers and sisters, that's you and me, is under attack. We face real threats to our religious liberty. Too many want to force us to accept and even pay for that which violates our deepest religious and moral convictions. I suppose the most obvious and egregious example is abortion, an evil like no other to accept the slaughter of the most innocent among us, of our unborn children by torturous dismemberment, well, it's simply beyond comprehension. And yet as a nation, we have done exactly that to over 60 million Americans since 1973. Can anything be more unjust than the slaughter of these innocents? Perhaps as a nation, we should turn to the prophets who repeatedly called the people of another nation, Israel, to return to the Lord before they experience divine judgment. Amos, for example, a ch chastised a wealthy Israel, a nation that practiced religion without justice, pleading with all, seek good and not evil, that you may live. Then truly the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you as you claim. Hate evil and love good. Let justice prevail at the gate. Then it may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will have pity on the remnant of Joseph. God expects us to act, so justice will prevail. You and I may think we're not important enough for our voices to be heard, but that's simply not true. Just consider how God has called on the weak and the obscure to be his messengers. Amos, for example, was a simple sheep herder and pruner of sycamore trees, and yet chosen by God he courageously confronted the hypocritical and unjust leaders of Israel. Isaiah and Jeremiah were both called from the womb to be great prophets. David, the young shepherd, raised up by God to be king of his people. And John the Baptist, dwelling in the desert, was destined from the moment of creation to be the herald of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, we too are called by God just as Amos, Isaiah, Jeremiah, David, John, the apostles, and so many others were called from obscurity to take God's word to the world. Like that tiny mustard seed of the gospel, wondrous things can come from even the smallest voice. Today we face so many challenges to the most fundamental of our rights. We, you and I, must plant and nourish that seed. We must speak up. We must defend our right to religious freedom in both the public square and the ballot box. To do so is a responsibility, an obligation that derives not from our citizenship, but even more so from our faith. Satan would love to turn us into today's gatherings, but believe me, that will not happen if we as a people of God, as the body of Christ, as a nation of free men and women, remain true to the one holy Catholic apostolic church and turn always to Jesus Christ as our sole guide, as our Lord and Savior. Yes, how blessed we are to be Americans. Let us pray that our children and grandchildren will always be able to say those same words. God love you.